right, so hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the CIC Imaging series. I'm Arielle and I'm a research assistant at the Douglas and I'm gonna be moderating today's talk. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Kimberly Young. Dr. Young is an associate professor at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Her research focuses on understanding the physiological mechanisms of positive emotional information and autobiograph autobiographical memory processing in healthy individuals and individuals with mood and anxiety disorders through behavioral, physiological, and functional imaging methods. Dr. Young's focus is on understanding onset and recovery of mental, from mental illness and developing new neuroscience-derived neurobiological interventions, including real-time fMRI and EEG feedback, which targets deficits in the processing of positive stimuli in patients with mood disorders. So we're really excited to have you here today, Dr. Young, um, discussing real-time fMRI and well neural feedback for major depressive disorder. And uh, just before we begin, I just want to remind everyone that um, questions will be left to the end. So uh, feel free to post them in the chat throughout the talk and after, and I'll read them out at the end. Uh, otherwise, I'll be monitoring raised hands once the talk is over during the question period. And uh, just a reminder, be sure that your microphones are off during the presentation. Um, so with that, I'll hand it off to you, Dr. Young. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, it's a pleasure to share my work with you. And today I'm going to be talking about our lab's real-time fMRI amygdala neurofeedback uh, intervention for depression and some of the progress we've made and the challenges we've run into as we've worked to develop this intervention. So uh, I will be going over, first I'm gonna to talk to you about autobiographical memory, what it is, why it's important, the uh, neural correlates of autobiographical memory, specifically focusing on the amygdala, our neurofeedback intervention, as well as how we have been recently applying it to uh, CBT. And then I'll end with some of the common concerns that we've been running into and how we're addressing those. So let's we'll start with autobiographical memory. Autobiographical memory is memory for personally experienced events. These are events that occur to you, occur at an identified time and place. And there are levels of specificity that a memory can have. So a memory can be specific, and that is a memory that occurred at an identified time and place and did not last longer than one day. And usually you test this by giving people keywords. So an example of a, of a specific memory to a keyword such as fail might be last Tuesday, I failed an exam. This is what you generally think of with autobiographical memory, single events that happen to you. But memories can also be categorical. These are summaries or categories of events without referencing one specific episode. So for our keyword fail, a categorical memory might be, I failed a lot of exams in college. There's a reference to several different events, but not one specific one is focused on. Memories can also be extended. And these are memories for events that lasted longer than one day. So in our fail example, an extended memory might be oh, that week I spent studying for finals. And finally, memories can be semantic. And these are just memories, facts without any events associated with them. So for that cue failure, um, I am a failure might be a, an example of a semantic memory. And it is a very well-replicated, well-established finding that patients with depression have difficulty recalling specific memories. And this is at present in those who are at risk for depression and those who are in remission from depression, suggesting it's a very enduring cognitive marker. It's also independent of symptom severity and does not change with traditional treatments available today. And so when I first started out, um, I wanted to characterize autobiographical memory deficits in depressed patients um, and, re and relevant populations. And so this was one of my earlier studies where we looked to characterize uh, over general recall. And we had healthy individuals, we had depressed individuals, and then we had uh, healthy individuals who are at high risk for depression, meaning that they had a first degree family relative who had been diagnosed with depression and then remitted patients who had experienced depressive episode, but had not had impairing symptoms for about three months. And what we found was we did replicate the general, the overgenerality effect 
the depressed patients had fewer specific and more categorical memories. And then when we looked at their specific memories and broke them down by valence, what we found is that both the depressed and the remitted patients had significantly fewer positive specific memories than either of our healthy groups. So it suggests that there's really this deficit for positive specific memory recall that is a characteristic of major depressive disorder. And so why is that important? Why, why do we care that people have trouble recalling specific memories? Well, it turns out that specific memory recall really helps us function adaptively in our daily lives. Uh, and, and it's related to a whole host of, function, of, the, of functions that we engage in. Uh, so for example, that helps us with problem solving. We use uh, memories of the past to plan for the future uh, and solve our current problems. We know that patients with depression have impairments in problem solving, and this has been found to be correlated to the degree of their overgeneral memory. Positive specific memory recall is also a core emotion regulation strategy, and it helps us to maintain optimism in the face of stress and monotony. We know that patients with depression have a great difficulty with emotional regulation, and they have increased feelings of hopelessness, and both of these constructs have been related to the prevalence of overgeneral memories. Finally, it helps us to develop and maintain social bonds. Uh, giving, having positive events, uh, autobiographical memories to share with people, uh, it creates social bonds and gives us more social experiences. We know that patients with depression do have deficits in social bonds and experiences, um, and it, social withdrawal predicts depressive symptoms. It's not known if, if this is necessarily correlated with overgenerality, but it's thought to be related to the inability to recall specific positive memories. And so this is a, a cognitive deficit we see in depression, and it's not addressed by conventional treatments. So uh, I just have a couple of studies that illustrate this point. The, this study here looked at uh, 28 days with an SSRI antidepressant. And what you can see is that the, uh, the, the percent of positive and negative specific memories did not change following antidepressant treatment. And the depressed patients still had more overgeneral memories relative to the healthy controls. This is also true with cognitive behavioral therapy. So in this study, uh, they looked at autobiographical memory specificity before and after a course of cognitive behavioral therapy. And again, they found there was no change, no significant change in the percent of autobiographical memories, specific autobiographical memories recalled. Uh, and so this leads to the question, well, okay, these, these treatments aren't targeting this cognitive deficit directly. Can we target memory specificity directly? And there is um, a, a new intervention called memory specificity training. And this is where depressed patients, uh, it's usually in a group setting and it's usually about five weeks, they practice recalling specific memories. Uh, and this is true, they recall all valences, positive, negative, neutral. And they have homework where they are uh, writing them down at home. So it's, it's just basically a lot of practice recalling specific memories with education about what a specific memory is. And in the short term, this does indeed increase memory specificity um, and improves depressive symptoms, but unfortunately, these effects are short-lived and they do not persist at follow-up according to a recent meta-analysis. And uh, another group uh, looked at whether or not depressed patients can even use these specific memories when they're able to recall them. Uh, and so they had a patient, they had healthy controls, remitted depressed and depressed patients watch a sad video and then had them recall positive memories to repair their mood. And what you see is that in the healthy individuals, this manipulation worked. The recalling positive memories reduce their sadness after, uh, it reduce the sadness that was due to watching the video. If you look at the remitted depressed patients, it had no effect on their mood and if you look at the currently depressed patients, their mood actually worsened. So just putting a depressed patient in a room, telling them to recall specific positive memories, 
could actually hurt them. And it's because they're not using positive memories in an adaptive way. And this is a, a recent study um, that showed that, um, that depressed patients don't receive the benefits that healthy individuals do when they recall positive memories. So um, in this study, positive memories boosted the mood and the positive self-statements made by healthy individuals, but this was not seen in the, in the depressed group. So it's not just the ability to recall positive specific memories that seems to be underlying depression. It seems they're not able to use those positive memories in an adaptive way as healthy individuals do. And so this led us to examine the neural correlates underlying autobiographical memory recall. And eventually we focused in on the amygdala. Now, I'm sure you have all heard about the amygdala's role in fight or flight. And that is absolutely true, um, but it's more than that. It is a salience detector. It responds to important stimuli in the environment, both positive and negative. It's also one of the core regions recruited during autobiographical memory recall in healthy populations. And in healthy populations, the amygdala is more active to positive memory recall than it is to negative memory recall. So amygdala seems to be very uh, important for positive autobiographical memory recall. And the amygdala is also very important for depression. And again, I'm sure many of you have heard that the amygdala is overreactive to negative stimuli in depression. And that's absolutely true. But there's more to the story. It's doubly dissociated from healthy individuals in that there's more activity to negative stimuli. So as you see here, increased activity to negative faces relative to healthies, but there is decreased or blunted activity to positive stimuli. So again, in the space task here, you see that the healthy individuals are bringing their amygdala online when they see the positive faces, whereas the depressed individuals are not. And we found this was true with autobiographical memories as well. So again, in our, our four group study, what we found was that for negative memories, our depressed patients had significantly increased activity relative to our healthy controls. But when we looked at the amygdala response to positive stimuli, there was this blunted response relative to healthy, remitted, and high-risk individuals. So it suggests that this, this response to positive stimuli is very clinically significant. Um, and when we looked at kind of the relationship between the amygdala and then symptoms and cognitive profile of depression, we found that the more patients brought their amygdala online when they were recalling positive autobiographical memories in the scanner, the less depressed they were and the more specific memories they were able to recall. So this suggests a mechanism by which positive autobiographical memory and the amygdala work together to help improve depressive symptoms. So we decided that we would target that mechanism directly with neurofeedback. So neurofeedback is where information about brain activity is fed back to the user. And the spatial specificity allows us to target specific brain regions, especially limbic structures um, and deep structures in the brain that have been implicated in emotional processing. Healthy individuals can learn to control activity in a variety of regions, including those important for emotion regulation. And so far there is evidence of clinical utility in reducing symptoms of chronic pain, tinnitus, Parkinson's disease, and addiction, all through the use of real-time fMRI neurofeedback. And the, you know, the main advantage of this is that it's non-invasive. There's no pills, there's no electrodes. Um, there, it's, it's a non-invasive intervention that is based on the decades of research we've done into the neural correlates underlying onset and recovery from depression. So it's informed by science, it's non-invasive, it uses principles of cognitive behavioral therapy to teach strategies that become self-sustainable and enhances feelings of self-efficacy. And it also leads to a better understanding of the processes underlying depression. 
Now, it is not a perfect solution. It does have some major disadvantages. And the, the primary ones are cost and environment. You need an MR scanner, you need an MR tech, uh, and you have to be free of metals and not claustrophobic. So it does restrict severely the uh, population that can engage in this intervention. And it does require a lot of resources. There's also the potential that maladaptive plasticity could be induced if dysfunctional strategies are used. So um, my goal or the goal of this intervention is to increase the amygdala to positive. And so we tell patients they want to think about positive memories. We give them some tips on, on how to think about positive memories. Um, but if they wanted to just increase their amygdala response and be successful, successful um, in, in increasing that, they could make themselves feel fear. They could make themselves feel anxiety. Uh, and that would increase the amygdala response and not be helpful. So in our studies, we are, we've emphasized very strongly that they need to stick to the strategy of positive memory recall. Uh, they can alter how they're thinking about their positive memories or what positive memories they're thinking about, but they should not stray from thinking about positive memories while trying to increase this amygdala response. And this is a rundown of the experiment, uh, the neurofeedback training experiment. Uh, we usually do two sessions and each session starts out with a baseline run. And that's where they're just asked to recall positive memories and no neurofeedback information is provided. And this gives us a baseline. It lets us know where they're starting at with their amygdala response. Uh, then we end with a transfer run, which again, no neurofeedbacks provided. They're just recalling positive memories. And the definition of neurofeedback success is the difference between this initial baseline and the transfer run. So what we'd like to see is a significant increase from baseline to transfer, showing that they're able to maintain this amygdala response in the absence of neurofeedback. The neurofeedback training consists of alternating blocks of rest, happy, and count. Rest is our baseline and it's used for our neurofeedback calculations and patients are just asked to clear their minds, not think of anything in particular. And then we have the happy condition. And this is where they're told to think of positive memories and increase the level of the thermometer representing the signal from their brain. This thermometer is updated every two seconds and it is an a moving average of the current time point and the previous two time points relative to the preceding baseline. Then we have the count condition. And the count condition is kind of our palate cleanser. Um, it's designed so that patients can distract themselves from the memory they're thinking about and allow their amygdala response to return to baseline. And so again, they do this two times, usually over two weeks. And in our studies, we have had an experimental and a control group, and the experimental group receives feedback from their left amygdala. And the control group receives feedback from the left horizontal segment of the interparietal sulcus. And so this is a region that's not implicated in depression or emotional processing, but can be activated by autobiographical memory recall. So both of our groups get the high tech train your brain intervention. Both groups engage in the same strategy of recalling positive memories and both groups learn to control a signal. But only in one case is that signal related to their depressive symptoms. And so the only in the experimental group receiving amygdala feedback do we expect to see any improvements. This is the uh, result from the very first clinical trial that we did with uh, this intervention. And what you can see is that this is their amygdala response um, at baseline. We do indeed replicate the deficit. The uh, patients are not bringing their amygdala online when they're recalling positive memories. Then we have training and transfer. And what you can see is that in the experimental group, they are indeed able to increase this amygdala response and then maintain it. Then they go away and come back a week later and we repeat the procedure. And what you see is some long-term transference. Their baseline now, a week later after training, is higher than what their initial baseline was. Again, we see the increase with, tra with training, maintaining during transfer, and the control group does not show a significant change in their amygdala response over the course of training. 
The control group does, however, show an increase in their parietal response over the course of training with less transference of learning, uh, less long-term maintenance. So you see they're not really bringing their parietal region online prior to the training, um, then they are able to do that with the training and maintain it in the transfer run in that training session. Uh, when they come back, they, they seem to be back to uh, baseline. But again, they are equally successful at raising the level of their parietal activity so that both groups have equal success at regulating the signal. When we look at the clinical effects, we see very large, significant decreases in both self-report and clinician-administered depression scales. So we have the Beck Depression Inventory, the Hamilton, and the Madras, and all three of them showed about a 50% decrease on average in the experimental group versus a very small placebo effect in the control group. We had 62% uh, meet cr criteria for response, meaning they had at least a 50% decrease in their depressive symptoms. And the third actually met criteria for remission after the intervention. And we uh, calculated our number needed to treat of four. This just shows that the groups were relatively equivalent uh, at the beginning of training. And then you see this rapid decrease in depressive symptoms in the experimental group, whereas the control group does not really change. And there's a correlation between neurofeedback success and depression score improvement, such that the greater the difference between baseline and transfer, the more you, the more successful you are at bringing your amygdala online after the training, the more of a decrease we see in your depressive symptoms. And so I, uh, I told you autobiographical memory, bringing it back to autobiographical memory specificity, Traditional interventions do not change autobiographical memory specificity. We were wondering, because we were having patients do this kind of repetitive positive memory task uh, with neurofeedback, if maybe we would be changing that. And so when we did the autobiographical memory task, what we found was that there was indeed an increase in the percent of specific memories recalled. And when we broke it down by valence, it was only an increase in the percent of specific positive memories recalled in the experimental group. The control group did not show any change. So even though both of them were recalling positive memories, something about the neurofeedback intervention with the amygdala have resulted in the ability to recall more specific positive memories. And the uh, results of a mediation analysis showed that indeed the amygdala was critical for this uh, clinical effect, that there was a relationship between increased memory specificity and decreased depression, but more so when the amygdala is brought online. So if you recall positive memories while bringing your amygdala online, you are likely to experience a significant decrease in your depressive symptoms. Now, the amygdala does not exist in a vacuum. I do not believe that I am only selectively targeting the amygdala and hitting nothing else in the brain. Uh, and so we did a functional connectivity analysis to look at what regions or networks were changing their connectivity with the amygdala after training. And what we found is that there were significant increases in connectivity between the amygdala and regions important for self-referential processing, salience processing, and reward processing. So the way we think this is working is that the amygdala is part of the salience network. We're tapping into that. We are making these memories something to pay attention to, to notice, to then relate to your sense of self and derive reward from. Um, so that's kind of the whole network picture of how we think this intervention is working. And we do have projects underway to directly target connectivity of the salience network rather than just targeting the amygdala in isolation. Uh, and so a, a lot of this, the, especially the, the increase in self-referential processing and reward um, and increased self-efficacy led us to wonder if this intervention would work well with, in combination with cognitive behavioral therapy. So we did uh, pre-treatment with amygdala or parietal neurofeedback prior to a course of cognitive behavioral therapy to see if we could improve outcomes from cognitive behavioral therapy. 
And the way um, I think these two interventions are working together uh, can be best illustrated with this idea of a self schema self concept. Um, this is a, a picture that was taken from uh, the Beck Depression Institute, where I was fortunate enough to be able to train with Dr. Aaron Beck before his death in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. And there's this idea that there's a self schema and, and there's a filter that lets new information into your self schema or how you define yourself. And in patients with depression, sorry, in patients with depression, negative information is very easily incorporated into the self schema. But positive information is either ignored or turned into something negative and then encoded with the self schema. And this, we see this a lot in our initial pre-scan interviews, when we have patients come up with three memories to use during training, the first thing they say to us is, I have no positive memories. They, they just don't have them available. Or, and then the second thing is that if they can get a positive memory, we get a yes, but. Yes, I graduated from college, but I don't feel like I'm living up to my potential. Yes, I had a great time with my daughter last weekend, but she's a teenager and we're gonna fight, I know a lot. A lot. Uh, so there's this inability to maintain the positivity of this information. And so by tapping into the salience network through the amygdala, we're changing the filter so that now negative information can be incorporated, but so can positive information. It's no longer discounted or changed to negative information. And we think that's what we're doing. We're preparing the brain to accept positive information which then uh, should potentiate the effects of CBT. And so uh, this, uh, we just finished up this, the follow-up for the study, uh, writing it up right now. Um, they did two neurofeedback uh, visits, either amygdala or parietal. And then they had 10 weeks of cognitive behavioral therapy. And it was always delivered by a single licensed clinician or her graduate student. And then we followed the depressive symptoms uh, at baseline during their first three weeks of therapy, at the end of therapy, and then we did a six month and then we recently added a one year follow up to assess their symptoms. And see, uh, we had 20 per group, mostly female um, with moderate to severe depression. And so this, uh, again, the results of the neurofeedback training what you see, again, is that there are patients show the deficit. They are not bringing their amygdala online when they're recalling positive autobiographical memories prior to training. Again, we see this increased activity with training and maintaining during transfer. Then week break, they come back, they do it again. And again, we see that this long-term transference is occurring. There is this increase of their baseline relative to their initial baseline. Again, we see increased uh, activity with training, able to maintain during the transfer. Um, and this is our, our metric of neurofeedback success, the difference from baseline to the final transfer. And again, no change in the control group in their amygdala response. Now, uh, showing you group means is great, but I also think it's really powerful to see this on an individual level and to see it working. So I'm going to show you uh, two little short videos of the, th of the, of the thermometer um, during a neurofeedback run. So this is one subject, and this is what their amygdala response looks like at baseline. Yeah, did that work? No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so what you can see, this is the zero level right here, this yellow bar you can see that their amygdala response is negative. At no point does it go up into the positive range. And again, this is where they start out. This is their baseline prior to any neurofeedback training. This is the exact same subject, but this is now their final neurofeedback training run. So they've had two sessions um, and they've been practicing. And now, again, here's the zero line. What you see is a very nice positive amygdala response and they're able to keep it positive throughout the entire block. 
And uh, another way of representing this, again, same subject, this is uh, looking at, this, this is rest, green is happy, blue is count, and you can see there's no real pattern of amygdala activity here, uh, maybe an increase during the count condition. But again, this is after their training, what you see now is a very nice pattern where the amygdala goes up during positive memory recall, down during count, maintains during rest, up during positive memory recall, down during count, maintains during rest. Uh, so again, I just think it's really great to show a single subject of this to really drive home the point of, of how it's of how it's working. And in this particular individual was very severely depressed starting out. Um, and by the six month follow up, they were in remission. And they were still in remission at the one year follow up. And so back to group results. Um, looking at the clinical change, we see that the patients started out at the same level of depression severity. But the people who received the amygdala neurofeedback had a significant decrease in their depressive symptoms and were less depressed by the start of cognitive behavioral therapy. So they started out lower than the, than the control group at CBT. They maintained this advantage for the first three weeks of therapy, having lower depressive symptoms than the people who had received parietal neurofeedback. But then, by the end of CBT, the groups were no longer different. They were equally better. And this suggests that our CBT therapist was great. Um, she was doing her job well. People responded to CBT as we would expect them to. And so what we were really interested in was whether or not these effects persisted uh, in, in, and whether there was any advantage later on in long-term outcomes. And when we look at the six month follow-up, what you see is that the people who got amygdala neurofeedback are continuing to improve. Their, their depression scores are continuing to decrease. Whereas those in the control group look like they're starting to relapse. And again, when we add the one year follow-up, this difference is maintained. Now, not everyone is reporting and there we are doing a sensitivity analysis, um, but there are, both there are equivalent numbers of people in the control group and the experimental group that responded to the one year follow up. So we do have group comparisons. And again, it's showing that even if the therapy is equally effective, this, it, this, enhance, this neurofeedback procedure seems to enhance the benefits and make them last longer term. We also replicated the effect, the uh, previous results of increase in neurofeedback success related to decrease in depressive symptoms. And this was true both at, the, at week three of cognitive behavioral therapy and at the six month follow up. Uh, the more you brought your amygdala online with training, the greater the decrease in your depressive symptoms at these follow up visits. And so this begs the question, how is CBT changing? How are these two interventions, are they working synergistically? Are they just two interventions that have nothing to do with each other? Uh, and so we consulted our CBT therapist and she was blind to group assignment. She did not know which subjects had received amygdala neurofeedback and which had received parietal neurofeedback. She just had patients that she delivered CBT to. So we gave her a survey and asked for each subject, please indicate the number of sessions you focused on each of these factors in your therapy. Core beliefs, positive cognitions, negative cognitions, positive behaviors, and negative behaviors. And what we found is that even though she didn't know what patient was in what group, she spent more time and more the per, greater percentage of sessions focusing on the positive cognitions and positive behaviors in the experimental group. Whereas in the control group, she spent more time focusing on negative cognitions. So this um, actually is in line with some of Dr. Beck's work that he wrote right before he died, saying that maybe we shouldn't be focusing so much on the negative. In, in therapy, that instead we should be focusing on hopes and goals and aspirations, not necessarily on problems. Um, and, and this result supports that, that the, the people that got better, it stayed better the longest were ones where they were focusing on positive things in cognitive behavioral therapy, rather than focusing on negative cognitions. 
So that is where we are today uh, with neurofeedback. Uh, and we do have some other clinical trials ongoing. One is in treatment resistant patients. Uh, and uh, again, another is a connectivity based neurofeedback intervention. Um, but as we've worked to develop this into something that is clinically available, uh, we have run into some challenges. And the three common concerns that I get are first, transfer of learning. Are you just non-specifically increasing the amygdala to everything, including negative stimuli, which would be bad. Uh, so we had to investigate that. Then who would generalizability? Who does this intervention work for? Is it any depressed individual? Is it a certain subset of depressed individuals? Um, who is this appropriate for? And then the million dollar question, will this ever be practical for clinical use? Am I ever going to be prescribing fMRI neurofeedback to my depressed patients? And so I'll go through each of these one by one. Um, so to assess transfer of learning, we had them do a different task. And so basically they saw two faces and they were told to then map that they were, then they were shown a bunch of, um, Face other faces during the run and were asked whether or not each face matched the identity of that target face. And the faces were presented below conscious awareness, so a mask, a mask face followed by a masking face, and the faces presented positive, neutral, and sad expressions. And so our variables of interest were the amygdala response to the sad versus neutral and the happy versus neutral presentations. And this way we could see, first of all, is our, our training generalizing to other positive stimuli and what's it doing to negative stimuli? And what we found was that there is indeed transference to other positive stimuli. The people, uh, the patients in the experimental group had a significant increase in their amygdala response to positive face presentations after the neurofeedback training, where we see no change in the control group. Now, but what the million dollar question, what about to negative faces? Are we just increasing the amygdala to everything, which would be bad? And the answer, fortunately, is no. What we found was that even though we're just training to upregulate to positive, we found a significant decrease in the amygdala response to negative face presentations, suggesting that we're normalizing the amygdala's emotional processing bias in these patients. The other uh, transfer effect that we looked at involved that count condition. So remember I told you it was palate cleanser, um, you know, it was not a math test, <laughs> but patients did not like this task. And we had to spend a significant amount of time before the intervention explaining the purpose, explaining that we didn't care about their math abilities and we wouldn't know if they were doing the math right and that this really shouldn't stress them out. Nevertheless, the first time they're asked to count backwards, what do we see? We see an enhanced amygdala response in both groups. Uh, and that suggests they're finding this emotionally arousing and based on their pre-scan interviews, emotionally arousing in a bad way. And in the control group, this elevated amygdala response is maintained. They keep bringing their amygdala online during the count condition. But in the experimental group, we're seeing a significant decrease in the amygdala response over the course of training. So it's just that they're no longer bringing their amygdala online. And patients actually reported that they found the counting relaxing after, uh, after the intervention. So again, we're just targeting upregulation to positive, but what we seem to be doing is training the amygdala to respond adaptively. And there was also a significant correlation between, a neuro, uh, between uh, the decrease in amygdala activity during count and decrease in depressive symptoms. So the more of that decrease we saw in your amygdala over the course of the training to the count condition, the greater the decrease we saw in your depressive symptoms. And this was also related to neurofeedback success. So the more you increased your amygdala activity during neurofeedback training to happy memories, the greater a decrease we see in the amygdala response to that count condition. 
So again, you know, this really suggests that even though we're just focusing on one direction, unidirectional training, we are leading training by directional control. We are creating a more normative pattern of amygdala responding. And this suggests that since we're affecting the amygdala response to negative stimuli, but we're not making people interact with negative stimuli, perhaps behavior, cognitive behavioral therapies really should be focusing on positive. Maybe we don't need to be focusing on negative cognitions and emotions so much with our depressed patients, that if we focus on positive, we'll see a resulting decrease in negative affect. Uh, next question I get a lot is who is this appropriate for? Um, and so in about 30% of uh, patients, they're just not able to learn how to regulate their amygdala. It doesn't matter how many sessions they get, uh, they just don't increase their amygdala response with training. And so I've combined the uh, three different um, clinical trials of this neurofeedback intervention uh, to get a bunch of baseline characteristics to see if we can determine who the successful neurofeedback regulators are going to be. Um, and you can see these are the three samples here. This was the original clinical trial. This was the uh, clinical trial with CBT. And this is our treatment resistant sample. And as you would expect, our treatment resistant sample is more severely depressed than our other samples. And our CBT sample had uh, a lower, uh, lower alexthemia score. Also want to draw your attention to the symptom change. And what you see is that we're significantly decreasing symptoms, but we're not replicating the huge effects that we saw in that first clinical trial. Uh, you know, it's about a 50% decrease in the first clinical trial and we're between 26 and 30% in the subsequent cl clinical trials. And this is something that is a well-known phenomenon, well-documented phenomenon that your effect sizes just don't replicate your, your, your clinical effects shrink as you do more repeated studies. Uh, and so I don't have an answer to why this is, but it, it is. Um, and, but so Combined sample, we have demographic features such as age and sex, and we have clinical features such as their depressive severity, the number of current episodes, the number of previous episodes, um, and then we have some demographic characteristics with anhedonia, alexthemia, uh, and then the palms to just to get a bunch of different emotions. We also included their baseline amygdala, so what their amygdala was prior to training. Um, and we were looking at what was related to neurofeedback success. And so when we put all of these in and looked at the correlation, there was only one significant correlation, and that was with baseline amygdala activity. So the more your amygdala was, the greater your amygdala was at baseline, the less successful you were. You have to have the deficit for the deficit targeting intervention to work. You need to have this blunted amygdala response in order to increase with training. We also found a significant effect of sex with females more successful than males at neurofeedback training. And when we put everything into a regression model, the uh, model that explained most variants only include baseline amygdala. So baseline amygdala activity accounted for 53% of the variance in amygdala neurofeedback regulation success. And when we look at the male-female distribution, what we see is that yes, the females are indeed more successful than the males, but there's also a significant difference at baseline. Whereas the men do seem to have a positive amygdala response prior to training and the females do not. Again, it suggests that there may be um, different mechanisms underlying depression in males and they might need different interventions. See a nice correlation between um, amygdala regulation success and the baseline amygdala response. So again, the, the lower your amygdala response, the more negative it is, the greater uh, increase we see with training. So suggest deficit targeting intervention, you need to have the deficit. And finally, people ask me if I'm ever going to have an fMRI neurofeedback clinic. Um, and I, you know, I, I do think that in some cases it will be feasible and appropriate to have fMRI neurofeedback. But we are also working on translating this to an EEG neurofeedback intervention. EEG cannot measure the amygdala, but what we've been doing is concurrent EEG fMRI so that we can identify correlates. What EEG 
sig- what is the EEG signature? What does it look like when the amygdala is brought online? Uh, and so we have developed this signature, um, which explains about 41% of the variance in the amygdala response of the fMRI. And we are training people to uh, match the signature. So this is what they see. We're kind of exploring what the best way to provide the feedback is. We have a, um, the four different frequency bands here. We have a, a average bar over here. We have head plots uh, for, for people who might wanna use that. And what we see is that people generally use, start out using the, the, the mean bar. And then once they gain control over that, they'll start working on the individual frequency bands. And the goal here is to match the signature. So we're just trying to get everybody to, to get the, this to, as close to zero as possible. And our initial pilot study suggests that this is indeed possible. And so now we have uh, efforts underway to see if they can regulate the signature and if it has any clinical potential in depressed patients. So uh, thank you all for listening to my talk. And here are the, the points that I hope you take home with you today. Uh, that real-time fMRI neurofeedback training to increase the amygdala response to positive memories results in symptom improvement in patients with depression relative to those that can receive control neurofeedback. Uh, when combined with cognitive behavioral therapy, both groups were uh, equivalent in terms of symptom severity at the end, but the experimental group maintained low BDI scores at the six-month and one-year follow-up relative to the control groups. So it suggests that this pretreatment with amygdala neurofeedback facilitates the cognitive behavioral intervention, and it's likely through this mechanism of focusing more on positive cognitions and emotions. Um, also, that even though we're training one direction up to positive, we're giving people bi-directional control and normalizing the emotional processing response. Our deficit targeting intervention is only effective in those who have the deficit, which makes a lot of sense, and men may have a different mechanism underlying their depression. And we are working to provide an EEG-only neurofeedback intervention. And I just want to close uh, with, I, I always want to you know, get lost in data. I always want to bring it back to the patients and why we're doing this. Uh, and these are some of, the, uh, feed, some of the feedback we've received from patients after the intervention. Um, your program has helped me so much. You've given me a sliver of light and I've held on to it for dear life. Uh, this is, thank you so much for the positive change this has brought in my life. I ruminate far less. Foul moods are short lived. I have a better idea of what it makes it, what makes me happy and what it is to feel happy. I can now improve my mood at will. Uh, so this is really affecting patients' lives, and that is why I continue to work on developing this. Um, and my my long term goal is to make this something that's available clinically for for patients with depression. And with that, I just want to thank my wonderful lab members and my international collaborators, um, especially Dr. Bederka, who passed away this past fall, was a giant in, in neurofeedback research. Um, and uh, thank you for paying attention. And I am happy to take questions. I will stop sharing my screen. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Young. That was a really insightful lecture. Um, so we have tons of questions in the chat. We can start with those. Um, so our first question, is the size of the amygdala bigger in depressed individuals? So volumetric studies, yes. Uh, the, there, there are conflicting results, but it does appear that the amygdala is larger in depressed patients. Okay. Our next question, um, does the role of the amygdala in positive autobiographical memory recall compared with negative imply that negative memories are encoded or accessed differently? This is true in healthy controls too, right? How do you define positive versus negative memories? So we let the, the individual decide what's positive and what's a negative memory. We don't decide for them. Um, we ask them to rate whether their memory was positive or negative. And we ask them about how they look at it now. Um, so if it might've been a negative experience at the time, but when they're recalling it right now, is it positive or negative? And this does suggest that there are, we not necessarily there are different differences in memory in the memory recall themselves but there are differences in the ways we process 
positive and negative information and that for healthy individuals, we bring on these salience and self-referential regions um, that, that help us use our positive memories adaptively. Whereas depressed patients aren't bringing these regions online for positive stimuli, instead they're bringing them online for negative stimuli, making negative stimuli much more relevant to their lives. Uh, great. Um, just a quick follow-up question for me. Do you um, do you have them come in with kind of a list ready of positive memories? Or? So yeah, the, the first session uh, before they do neurofeedback, what we do is we sit down with them and we have them come up with three positive memories. And that can take a while. Uh, that can take, <laughs> we can take 40 minutes sometimes just to get them to have positive memories. But what's really exciting is that at the end of the study, they come out with so many more memories. They, you know, there's, there's this cascading effect where even they, it was like pulling teeth to get three memories before the training, but after the training, they have this whole library of positive memories. Oh, wow. Well. Okay, so our next question, um, apart from MDD, has this been investigated in bipolar disorder, specifically during the depression phase? Example, do you have BPD with um, recall, sorry, BPD also recall fewer positive specific memories? Is the amygdala double dissociation seen in BPD too? Great question. And so uh, we have investigated this in uh, bipolar disorder, and we have found that it works just like an antidepressant and it will flip people into a manic phase. So um, we, uh, we uh, screen out, we try to screen out for bipolar, but in our initial studies, we did have a couple bipolar individuals who were included um, at mistaken diagnosis um, and they all went into a manic phase immediately after the intervention. One went and gambled away a, a lot of money. Uh, another became very irritable and aggressive towards her, her family. Um, so the, the, the amygdala response is, is different in bipolar depression. They do have fewer specific positive memories, but it suggests their amygdala um, is not underactive to positive stimuli. And by increasing that response, we're actually flipping them into a manic phase, just like we would with a typical antidepressant. Um, just a quick follow-up from Gabriel. Doesn't that mean you could use this to differentiate depression versus bipolar? That's a great question. Yeah, um, we, I, I believe so, but because they, they do not show this blunted amygdala response to positive stimuli, and we have published that. Um, so it could absolutely be used as a way to distinguish bipolar from unipolar depression. Um, so just for um, you guys to know, I'm going to go through each person's questions once, and then if we have more time, I'll go back because there's a few people have multiple questions here. Um, so for the next question, I'm familiar with fMRI, but not real-time feedback. Signals are typically incredibly noisy. I'm interested slash impressed how you can evaluate and filter those to thermometer for neurofeedback. Yeah. So that is, uh, you know, that, that is the software company. Uh, Turbo Brain Voyager has, has really worked to develop this, this uh, processing streamline where processing pipeline where the images are pulled immediately from the scanner in real time. And we do submit them to some low level processing, including uh, spatial smoothing um, and uh, uh, motion correction in real time, as well as physio correction. So we are correcting in real time for that. The signal is still noisy, um, and but it, it's good enough uh, to, to, for people to be able to learn from it. Okay, our next question. Um, are the participants able to ar articulate what they're doing slash what strategies they're using during the training as they manipulate the thermometer? Yeah, so we've been working a lot on, on, on post-scan interviews to try and understand what it is they're doing. Um, and what the, the common theme seems to be first making these things important. So, so recognizing the importance and the existence of these events, um, but then really focusing on how they relate to your current sense of self, how these memories fit in with the person you are today seems to be an important strategy. Uh, and we're actually looking at doing a study, a controlled trial where instead of the parietal neurofeedback, we just have them focus on what significant, what aspects of the memory were important and how it relates to their sense of self to see if we can uh, get a strategy that is effective without the neurofeedback. Great. Um, next question. 
This reminds me of MEG neurofeedback studies. Any effort to implement control conditions completely unrelated to the task, example, sham increase in thermometer recording or other patients? Uh, yeah, so that you know that the choice of a control condition in neurofeedback studies is is quite controversial. It's a hot topic for debate, um, and the two most widely used control conditions are mine, mine, which is the alternate region, um, and then the other one is yoke sham. Uh, and so that's where you show a participant the feedback signal from another participant, and so they they don't actually control the signal, but they still get this the success signal, uh, and that does seem to again we do still seem to see the differences between the experimental and the control groups um, there are a lot of control that to, to really control for this we would need a lot of different control groups one with just strategy one with yoked uh, one maybe doing some sort of other biofeedback there are, there are a lot of different way control conditions that can be used um, in these studies and so we really just have to pick what it is you want to focus on. And for me, it was kind of this, this, this successfully regulating a signal and whether or not that alone was sufficient or if it mattered what signal. Okay, so we're running a little low on time. So I'm going to ask, um, we have a couple raised hands. Um, do you want to start, Yashar? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. I just, uh, before I ask my question to make sure the experimental approach between the experiment and the control that you use another region, in both cases, you ask them to focus on a happy memory. Yes. And at the same time, elevate the activation in those particular regions. Yes. But you only see the effect on the ones that activate the amygdala. Yes. Does it need to be their own memory? Can't you use just some happy memories? Because... That's a good question. Um, and so we, we've we explored, you know, that, that's a question people have asked me before. Can you just show pictures of kittens, pictures of puppies. Um, and the we we person we have not done the study, but we personally believe that it's the self-referential part of this that is allowing them to use positive memories adaptively and then function in their daily lives. So I, I do think the self-referential aspect is critical, um, but we have not done the studies to see if just any memories or any positive stimuli would be equally effective. Thanks. Um, so we, we have time for one last question, Gabriel. So, so thanks very much for the presentation. I have a more kind of more generalized uh, question about the autobiographical memory component. Uh, do you, have you encountered uh, patients uh, who don't have autobiographical memories either um, or don't have very good, let's go that way, uh, uh, autobiographical memories that it is either positive or negative? Uh, so we do see uh, a large proportion that we do find a lot of semantic memories in depressed patients. So they're they're not getting to specific events. Um, is that answer your question? I, I think so. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. okay so um, we are out of time, but Dr. Young has agreed to hold a discussion afterwards. So um, I know a lot of you still had some questions, so anyone can feel free to stay on for a bit. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Young, for your amazing presentation. Thank you. I'll jump in. Thank you so much for, for the presentation. It's so exciting to see something new in the treatment of depression. <laughs> um, my question is more, um, did you see any difference in ability to control signal between the control and the amygdala group? Because it seems to me that there's a, if, if there's a very big difference in control, you're giving a stronger sense of self-efficacy in the amygdala group. And that might explain the, the, the difference and then maybe you can exploit that without very expensive machinery, you know? Yeah, so uh, what we find is that the control group is as successful at increasing their parietal activity as the amygdala group is at increasing their amygdala response. So we don't, they, they, when you look at the, the individual training data, it, it does look like, um, the amygdala group has an easier time with the transfer runs. They're, they're able to maintain that without the training. And so that it could be playing a role, but in terms of absolute success, they did not differ between groups. Awesome. Thank you.